fish on. This is the New York Angler Fishing Podcast, brought to you by nyangler.com, your secret spot online. Hosted by the man who introduced New Yorkers to the world of online fishing, Mr. George Skaka. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the New York Fishing Podcast. My name is George Skaka and I will be your host. I'm very excited today. This is a special edition as I bring you the masterful work of Chris Paparo, who is known on Instagram and, you know, all the social media platforms as Fishing Guy Photos. And if you don't follow him, if you've never heard of him, you definitely should. He shows you things that we have around Long Island and fish that we have swimming that we truly had no clue uh, that were even in our waters. I've seen photos and films of uh, cobia fry. I've seen moonfish. You know, I've seen things that I really had no clue uh, were in our waters. And and he brings to light many, not just fish, he's a falconer, he's, he's an outdoorsman, and he brings to light a lot of uh, what most Long Islanders and New Yorkers miss, and that is the great marine life we have here around Long Island. So without further ado, here is Chris Paparo, the fishing guy. I am on the line with Chris Paparo. Uh, many folks may know him. He's the fish guy photos on Instagram. Uh, that's one account I check. I have to tell you, I have to check it every day. Um, Chris was born and raised on Long Island. Uh, he's been exploring the wilds of the island for over 30 years. As the owner of Fish Guy Photos, he's a wildlife photographer, writer, lecturer, who enjoys bringing public awareness to the diverse wildlife that calls Long Island home. His passion is for coastal ecology, fishing, and the outdoors led him to obtain a BS in marine science from LIU Southampton, and he currently manages the new marine sciences center at the Southampton campus of Stony Brook University. So the way I see it, Chris, is you're, you're one of these people that, you know, there's, they say like 5%, but 5% of the people enjoy what they do, actually enjoy what they do for a living. I'm going to guess you're in that 5%. Yeah, this, this I every, everything I do, um, I enjoy. I mean, it's there's, a, there's very rarely a day where I go to work where I'm dreading going to work. You know, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's definitely a, a passion of mine. Well, I tell you, you, you know, you bring a lot more than uh, it's it's a lot more than just fishing, right? So, yeah, um, you know, you're, I mean, things I've been saying for thirty years how. People live on Long Island. Many of them don't even know they're on an island. They have no clue. We've got, you know, great whites. We've got whales. We've got dolphin. We got it all. But uh, for some reason, people, uh, they seem to forget that they actually do live on an island that's got a lot more wildlife than uh, than they even realize. And, and you definitely bring it to their attention. So, um I imagine a lot of work goes into some of some of the footage and some of the photos and um, like you, you just don't happen to get lucky and send the drone up and catch a freaking school of Benita, you know, on a rain day. Yeah. yeah. You know, I you imagine. Know, I, I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's definitely a lot more to that. I mean, I, I get often, you know, through my social media channels, I often get people saying, man, you were lucky. You get to see so much cool stuff. And you know what? I'll be honest with you. There's some luck. There's definitely some luck to it. Um, but I think a bigger part of it is I put in my time. You know, I'm, I'm out there every day at some point, you know, uh, you know, like often feel like, well, how do you have the time for all this? I'm like, well, I'll get up early before work and spend an hour at the beach, you know, and just, and everyone's like, well, you know, I can't do that. I'm like, well, what are you doing from, you know, I'll mention, you know, from six to seven. I'm like, well, I'm sleeping. I'm eating breakfast. I'll get up a little earlier and just get out there and do it, you know? So getting out there, uh, is quite important. I mean, even, you know, I was out this morning and I didn't find anything that 
no, I mean, I found some cool stuff, but nothing that I was able to capture on a photo or video that would be a post, you know, a social media post. But um, that that's just it, you know, that maybe tomorrow will be a banner day and I'll find a bunch of whales or some albies ch- chasing peat fish or sharks, uh, you know. But again, it's it's you just got it. You got to be out there. You're not going to see this stuff sitting on your couch. So um, what exactly do you do at the uh, Marine Scientists uh, Center? I mean, do you guys do any kind of fishery studies or counts or anything of we, that nature? We do it. We do it all. So, I mean, my so my role at, at Stony Brook uh, University is I manage, as you mentioned earlier, the Marine Sciences Center. So the it's a seven. It's a it's now we're just in our uh, coming into our eighth year now. So it's it's still fairly new, uh, but it's a ten million dollar research facility on Old Fort Pond, which is in Southampton, which is one of the easternmost uh, bays within Shinnecock Bay. And uh, I'm not a researcher myself. You know, often people think that I'm a researcher, but uh, I am not. Uh, but I work with uh, nu- numerous researchers that study everything from harmful algal blooms like the brown tide uh, all the way to researchers that are studying the local whales. Um you know, right. and in between, there's everything. Uh, there's there's uh, not a lot of fisheries management type stuff that goes on here, but a lot of what we'll look into maybe can help fisheries managers kind of get a picture on, you know, maybe where fish are, where they move, what they feed upon, what kind of habitat they prefer. So, you know, we're pretty much providing information for the managers to then make a decision. Yeah, I've seen... Um, like you have, so I've seen some underwater video where you have, uh, I guess it's some kind of a contraption that's, uh, putting bait out kind of like a chump slick and it, you know, yep. draws fish in and I'm, I'm seeing photos of stuff that I had no idea we're even in our waters. You know, I, I, I mean, I think we've got some tropical fish up here that, uh, we never even knew existed or maybe they're just showing up. I don't know. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's and that's just it. I mean, I get, you know, uh, you know, one comment I get as I mentioned is always people say, "Oh, you're so lucky." And then usually the most next common question or comment I should say uh, is, "I have been fishing these waters for X amount of years, say 50 years, and I didn't know we had half this stuff here." And you know, most of this stuff has always been here. It's just a matter of slowing down and paying attention to your surroundings. Um, you know, like you mentioned, tropical fish. Um, you know, tropical fish have been drifting to Long Island and the New England area since the Atlantic Ocean was first formed. I mean, they, they ride the Gulf Stream, uh, which is a river of water that comes out of the Caribbean. And some of these fish swim here as adults, like the great trigger fish. Uh, others drift here as, as larval fish, such as like butterfly fish, angel fish, file fish, a lot of your reef fish. And, um, you know, when they get to Long Island, you know, there's an abundance of food and habitat and they'll settle out. Uh, a lot of those larger fish that, that swim here under their own power, like the, 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 the trigger fish or stingrays, they'll actually swim south again when the water gets too cold. Uh, a lot of the tropicals, such as the, the reef type fish, such like butterflies, angel fish, file fish, uh, unfortunately, they'll perish because <clears throat> um, they don't really migrate uh, naturally anyway. You know, they kind of settle on a reef and they'll be there their whole life. Maybe they'll go deeper or shallower, but they're not going to go great distances. Right. Uh, and then we get <clears throat> other other larval drifters that um, will survive, and most of those are like the jacks. So locally, you know, we get creval jacks, permits, pompano, African pompano. Um, these fish spend their whole life swimming like bluefish and striped bass. So as the water temperatures get cold, they'll just school up and go south. Um, you know, and these fish, they'll show up, you know, by usually early July. And I've collected them as late as Thanksgiving. You know, it all depends on how yeah, quickly the water I- gets cold. Yeah, I know someone who was, I don't know, 15 miles um, south of the Carimbra, and he came into, like, a school of everything. I mean, it would, you know, they would uh, drag us, pull him back. You know, the link floating, floaters all over the place. And 
He said they caught everything. He brought back a king mackerel. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. He caught the yeah. guy caught a king mackerel. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, it, and, you know, some of those fish, you don't have to even go that far. Uh, I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. mackerel I've been getting, you know, in the bays. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, the, the butterfly fish and whatnot that I mentioned, I've seen them up in three or four feet of water. Um, so, you know, a lot of these fish are, again, within reach to the average average angler. Right now, so what do you uh, like? I'm um, right now. I'm looking at a photo, um, one of many you had of whales that, you know, they're they're literally on the beach. The beach is packed, and it looks to me like nobody's even looking at the whale. I'm like, you can't possibly be standing there and not see it. And you know, I know you and I both had the, uh, I'll say pleasure, honor of uh, fishing at Tanaku in Alaska. So, you know, we got to see a lot of whale. I know when I was there, I saw a lot of whale activity. Oh, yeah. yeah you yeah. know, and um, to see this in shore, I mean, I'm involved in this, I don't know, 35 years, 40 years in, in media itself. Never saw anything like this. I've never seen the right. whales in sh- this far in shore. Um, even the tuna fish, you know, 20 miles, they catch and fish. So, what, the thing what is, you-, you know, the thing is with that, though, and it is actually common. The problem is there's nobody alive today that remembers the good old days. You know, uh, Long Island was a whaling port and uh, yeah. back in the day, and it was a coastal whaling port. So often they would spot whales from shore, ring a bell, the crew would go out, harpoon the whales and bring them back. And uh, they, they hunted these things almost to extinction. And uh, what we're seeing now is uh, due to protections, you know, the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, um, you know, we've start, you know, we protected these whales, so they make a slow recovery on their own. Uh, we've started cleaning up the waters, you know, so local waters are not as polluted as they once were. Uh, and more importantly, we've started to protect their food, which is the Atlantic menhaden, which is better known as the bunker locally. Um, you know, that's another fish that was, you know, heav- heavily harvested, and uh, that has impacts. And then as soon as that fishery was regulated, we started seeing giant schools of bunker, and then the whales and tuna and the other f- animals that feed on those bunker then return as well. So, um, you know, seeing a whale off the beach like that might be crazy and uh, rare for us, but historically, that's that's where they that's always. That's where were, it used so. to be. That's yeah. where it used to. I totally believe that. You know, I believe it. I mean, there were quotes that you could walk across these striped bass. There was so many in the water. I mean, you know, I, I believe that. And, uh, you know, I, I was behind that bill to help close out that uh, keep Omega out of our waters altogether, and, which is the major bunker redun- uh, reduction you know, company, maybe the yep. only, I think, on the East Coast. But I just read where they took it. They also um, took a hit with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries uh, Commission for overfishing bunker. And they came out with a number that said if we were to say bunker, the biomass of striped bass could increase as high as. 30 percent so wow. um you know for something that they're using for cat food i'm sure that maybe they ought to target those uh those flying asian carp that that sounds like a good sure. cat food you know, to me <laughs> you know and that's, and that's just it like you say with like the striped bass and everything you know we can you know everyone but you, you often will hear in in the in the fishing community, you know, oh, we need to have a moratorium on striped bass, or we need to do this and we do that, you know, and that's great. You could stop catching striped bass all you want, but if you don't fix the problem, uh, and it's not, oh, not, it's not always overfishing, you know, there's habitat destruction. I mean, these fish spawn in the Hudson River, you know, so if their spawning grounds are contaminated, well, that's going to affect the offspring survival. I mean, so there's, it's really a big picture, you know, and I, we are definitely starting to see that, that some fisheries managers now are starting to look at a bigger picture. Uh, you don't Absolutely. realize how important everything is connected. It's all interconnected. And if one thing is out of whack, uh, that really can uh, have a dramatic effect on the whole big picture. 
Absolutely. And we're starting to see that. We'll, we're starting to see proof of that. Um, my personal concern, and I don't want to actually get too far into it, I, I'm i not a, a favorite. A fa- you know, I don't like this, uh, this slot rule. I feel we're directing too much pressure at uh, certain age groups of the fishery. Um, I don't, I don't think it's, it's good. It may be good for other fisheries, but I really don't think it's the answer for striped bass, but, uh, that, that's a subject for, that's, yeah. that, you know, that I could do 50 shows on that. Uh, but, uh, I just really wanted to talk to you about, you know, so it's, so you're sitting there, you're spending hours, right? You send a drone up, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, what the heck is this? Is that a bluefin? Is that this and that? That You must be like, uh, I don't know, like a detective looking for stuff in the background yeah, of every photo. Sometimes it just it happens, you know. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I posted a video that went went around pretty quickly of uh, probably at least twelve to fifteen black tip and spinner sharks uh, that were frenzy feeding around a school of albies. Uh, and that particular morning, I'd gone out before work like I always do, and this time it was a nice morning, so I took my boat out and figured to see if I can catch some albies, you know, before work. And I did. I was on them. I caught you know three or four fish and. I was like, ah, oh, you know what? It's so calm, and there's no birds or boats chasing. There's no boats chasing the fish down. There's no birds getting in the way of my drone. Um, let me fly the drone and get some cool footage of the albies. And uh, I put up the drone, and within two seconds, I was like, oh man! I, and I didn't realize I, I did not see this from the water. Right. While I was fishing, but all of a sudden a shark comes up off the bottom, then another and another and another. And all of a sudden there was, like I said, 12 to 15 sharks that were joining in on this frenzy. And uh, it lasted for about three minutes or so. And they went down. I brought the drone back to get a new battery. I sent it back up and it was over. Oh, as quickly as it started, it was over. And, um, but like with that, that was, there's a little bit of luck. Cause again, I was really just looking to get the Albies, uh, and got these sharks and it was just something I was how totally deep, unexpected. How deep see. were you? Uh, <laughs> I was in about 25 feet of water. Oh so was, my God. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> there, was, uh, there was a line of surfers a couple hundred yards away. I mean, it was not, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, and that that's what was it's crazy too is when you I know there was about 15 surfers that were like I said maybe 300 yards away. Um I was on the other side of the break. They were on the inside of the break and you know, everyone right away gets freaked out about sharks. Like, oh my god, the sharks are going to eat us and these sharks are all around us and they can care less for the most part about people, you know. So uh, I totally kind of agree. It's always been that way. If they bite you, all right, granted one bite could kill you, but they never sure. they never come back for a second bite cuz they don't like what you're tasting like and and these these Sharks are feeding on bunker. They're not right. going to mistake a person, which they could if we had enough seals around, but they're not going to mistake a person for a seal or expect to see a seal. So, sure. I mean, you know, and, and that's and that's just it. You know, a lot of it's a mistaken identity. And the other the other thing, too, which I which I find totally amazing is, you know, on average in the world, there's about 75 to 100 attacks worldwide in a year. When you think about that number, it's it's insignificant. And people are always like, well, I'm never going to the water again. I'm never going to the water again. But that same person will jump behind the car, that, uh, the, the wheel of their car, and go down the highway and get on the expressway without a thought in their mind about it. But chances are they're going to get in a car accident, you know. Um, and but nobody's afraid of driving their cars, but they're afraid to go swimming. Uh, I wish people had the same fear of driving as they do of sharks. We'd probably have much safer highways. I, um, but it know, makes it, no sense. And they don't no. just have a fear. We're talking. I know so many people. You know, I'm 65 years old, so we were around when Jaws first came out. You know, so yeah. and so, I know many people. That will not, they just won't go in, in the water, in the salt water. I'm like, you realize, like, no one's been bit. I mean, yeah. oh, I heard there was a, a great white. It might have been. He didn't want you. Believe me. He was looking after those other little sharks, probably. Exactly. But, you exactly. know, that's, uh, but you have to admit, 
we we did see a lot of shark acts, all those spinner sharks and um, yeah, and you know the spinners and the black tips are definitely not something that are common in our area. That's more of a southern species, right? Um, so it's that was definitely a rare thing, you know. But the browns, the the duskies, the sand tigers, you know, those are all sharks that have always always been here, you know. And, oh, uh, absolutely. I think I've heard a lot of this. You know, it's funny. I talk with this with my shark biologist colleagues, you know, and there are definitely populations that are on the rise. Uh, but then there's also, we always have to kind of consider social media. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, if somebody caught a shark from the surf, I heard it secondhand from the kid working behind the counter who heard it from somebody who came in prior. But now you catch a shark, see a shark or anything, it's instantaneously broadcast on social media and the world can see it within a couple seconds. Uh, it's going around. So there's some of the sightings I think will have a lot of it has to do with just the ease of getting that sighting out there now as well. Oh, absolutely. 100%. I mean, what I would give to have a camera video back in the day when I was sharking, you know, and I had a great white come up and right. lift his head up and look at me between my twin engines. And I was like, OK, <laughs> start it up. <laughs> get get the baits in, you know. So oh, yeah. um, so do you concentrate just on what's happening um in the uh, in the South Shore, or do you do any Long Island Sound stuff? And then I want to ask well, you about some some of the fish. You I eat. mean, my, I mean, I I you know I get around. Uh, my my thing is though I I live in Riverhead and I work in Southampton, so so you a lot of my work tends just to be in those areas. Um, and then the other part of it too ends up being access. You know, as as you know here on Long Island, access is such a problem. You know, and uh, and it's getting worse, it, and it needs to be and addressed. Yeah, it's gotten a lot worse. I mean, you used to be able to go down to like a boat ramp in January and not have an issue. Um, but, you know, I, I got I got a ticket, you know, in January because I was at a town boat ramp. I'm like, what? This is crazy. No one's, you know, but, it has but now been, it's year round. Yeah, this look, we're in the middle of a freaking pandemic. We're trying to get people out of their house. This gets me so annoyed. I'm like, leave us alone. You know, we're doing the right thing. Oh, um, yeah. You know, I saw her on a video. John Skinner got stopped in the middle of the day by himself, waiter fishing and you know, he had an ECO come over. I have nothing opposed to ECOs. I mean, I have a lot of respect for him. But we're in a pandemic. The guy is all rigged up as a, as a you know, a sport fisherman. Did you see him, like, carrying bass or something? I mean, right, right, right. But anyway. Yeah, no, they, they're definitely, you know, like Southampton changed all their regulations as far as permits go. You know, I used to be able to go, it was July 4th first to Labor Day, no permits. And then they went May 23rd to September 30th. And it used to be just nine to six. Now it's nine to nine. And it got really difficult to, you know, I used to be able to just go down to the beach in September after work and, you know, six o'clock get down there and do some surf casting or whatever. And couldn't do it this year. Now I can, because they have to, unless they change the signs again, but yeah, access has gotten really difficult. And it's on both shores. Um, yeah. The, um, on the North Fork, a, a marina that's been open like uh, forever has been bought up by the same guy who who bought uh, Dorier's, and he's not allowing people to use that boat launches. There are no public launches out on Orient Point right now, so right. Um, you know it's 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 everywhere and it's getting worse, and uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. But you got to get anglers organized and in this day of social media you would think it'd be easy to do that but it actually made it worse because everybody knows everything so uh, exactly (laughs) it's hard so now i'm looking at a photo and it looks pretty good you're talking to a guy who's pretty bad at uh somebody coming and bringing me a chunk of tuna and me slicing that baby right up and making a poke bowl or you know a whole bunch mm-hmm. of stuff out of it. Um, so I'm looking at this picture of this Albie, right, <laughs> that you cut yeah. up. And I'm like, yeah. I can't even think of how many of those things I look. Well, I don't catch that many. None this year, but I really didn't target them. But um, I have 
let quite a few of those fish I've released them. They never even thought to sashimi them. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, does it taste a lot like a tuna? It looks like a freaking slice of tuna. Yeah, so so that's the thing. So, I mean, for those that follow me on social media, you'll realize I eat everything, uh, and I'll give everything a go. You know, I think a lot of anglers get in their head that it's a trash, something is a trash fish, and will never try it because their friends told them it was gross. And, uh, and if it's not that, they go to try it themselves, and they just don't know how to prepare things, you know, uh, like everything. I mean, I can give you filet mignon to cook, and if you don't know how to cook it, you could turn it into shoe leather and garbage. Oh, um, absolutely. I've done it. So the thing with the Albies, you know, it is a tuna. It's a true tuna. So just like all tuna, they have to be bled. You know, you got to bleed that thing right away. You got to get all the blood out of it and you got to ice it. Um, if you do that and you get it home, you then have to take proper care in filleting it. Uh, it's not like a sea bass or a flounder. You know, it's, it's got a different body structure. When you fillet it off uh, down the center, there's the blood meat, you know, the bloodline. And it's pretty thick on an Albie. So you got to trim that off. Right. Right. Um, and it's, you'll notice a difference. It's this really deep, dark red. And then once you trim that off, the rest of the fish looks great. And if you, as you saw in that picture, it looks gorgeous. Yeah. Now, am I going to sit here and tell you that it tastes like bluefin, yellowfin, or big eye? No, not at all. It's, I'd much rather those fish over Alby any day. But is it bad to eat? Not at all. Um, that uh, last weekend, I caught, I kept two. We caught a bunch, but I kept two because I had, had a little dinner party going. I, a couple friends come over for dinner, and I sashimied half of it, and I tartared the other half, and it was gone. There was not a drop left on the plate, you know. And but the thing with this though is, if you know, not only do you have to bleed it, ice it and fillet it properly, you pretty much have to eat it that night. Um, I have tried all sorts of things to prolong the life of this, the shelf life of the fillet, but by next day in the fridge, it, the meat starts turning brown and starts getting a little bit fishy. Uh, I've tried freezing it. It turns black in the freezer. It just doesn't, it, it's one of those things. So I, I, you know, I keep one or two here or there throughout the season, uh, but most of mine go back. Um, but you know, like I said, if you want to try eating it, it's definitely doable. You just have to take the right measures to, to eat it. And, uh, like I said, now, you know, most people when they eat it are shocked. I've given it to some people that are big anglers, and then everyone's eating it, and they're like, "Wait a second, I did this for a writers, uh, New York State Outdoor Writers Association uh, two years ago. We had a conference, and I took some people out catching albies. We kept one. I filleted, sashimi it for the whole group. Everybody ate it. They ate it all. There was nothing left. And one of the guys comes up. He goes, so what did you do? Because I've always been told these are garbage. And I told him exactly what I did. And uh, he was shocked because he's like, there's no way that was an albie. But the person had never tried it before, you know, just gone on word of other people. So. Well, that's exactly where I was at until yeah. I saw that photo. Now, here's yeah. another one, right? I, I've actually brought this up to pretty much every angler I talk to. Right. And I saw you, not just you, other anglers are now eating sea robins. Now, when I say now, I know people historically have. Right. Yeah. So, I've eaten them since I was a little kid. So for me, eating a sea robin is old hat right now. It's I mean, we've we have always eaten them. So so there uh, there's an example of the trash fish which you were talking about before, or I'm not saying it's a trash fish. Right, right, right. But yeah. people consider it to be a trash fish. But when you think about it, uh, the fish gives you a pretty decent fight, right? Yep. Some of them are pretty big. And yep. that tail section probably does taste pretty decent. Me, I, I, I'm not a big porgy guy. And for some reason I'm thinking they're going to have that kind of a taste. Um, but, um, so I never tried it, but tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, you know, everyone gets intimidated on filleting them. That's usually the first thing. Cause they're like, how do you fillet this thing? And this, it's just a tail. And you know what? It's funny when you say just the tail, because a sea bass really is just the tail. If you think about it, no one, you know, it's the same fish. It's just differently shaped. So this one's a little bit stockier and longer, but it's the same exact body uh, as a sea bass. Um, you know, so filleting them is not tricky. I have a video on my uh, Vimeo channel on filleting a sea robin and, um, 
you flay them. You can cut the pin bones out real simple. So it's a boneless fillet. Uh, my favorite go-to is ba- beer battered and fried. Um, like when I'm doing a fish fry, you know, like, so I'll go fishing with people and I always, and I love to cook and I love to share a whole experience. So we'll go out fishing. I say, all right, look, we'll go fishing. We'll have seafood for dinner. That's a pretty bold statement to say you're going to bring home seafood. You know, we, none of us, nobody's that good, but almost anybody can find some sea robins. So we go out, we'll fillet a bunch of sea robins and I'll make fish and chips with them. And I can't cook them fast enough. I hear um, that. I like, do hear that. I hear that. You know, and my other second favorite, and I bring this in all the time to the college for the students, uh, is ceviche. Um, you know, just sliced, marinated with some uh, grapefruit juice and lime juice, and then tossed with a salsa. Uh, it is dynamite. Uh, the other thing I started doing this summer was I was smoking them. I fillet them, skin them, uh, debone them, smoke them on applewood, and I was mixing them into um, like a fish dip. Yeah, that's uh, like, nice. Like little- I do that with a bluefish. Yeah, it's dynamite. Yeah. Um, I've eaten them raw. I've had them sliced in and eaten as sashimi. It's not, it's not the greatest quality for that. It doesn't taste bad just the way it. It's just not a appeal. You know, it just doesn't have that nice red or golden color of like a salmon or something like that. But, um, but no, I mean, I and they freeze well. You know, so you could put them in the freezer and you know get like six months out of them. So you know, this time of year, even though fluke season's closed, I'll sometimes go and load up on sea robins just to stack them in the freezer, just so I have some fresh fish for the winter. Right. Um, right. You know? Yeah, I tell you, the sea bass bite. We spend a lot of money on fuel, tackle, docking, all Uh. this kind of stuff. So to go out there and come home with nothing, not that that's a bad thing either. I mean, you know, it's not always about coming home with something. But it's very nice. It's nice to go out and come home with some fresh seafood that you can eat, you know. And um, sea robins will often save the day. Well, let me tell you, I I had the... uh, fortune of fishing south shore cholera area and all those you know different uh, area spots over there this year for the first time right um the long island sound fluke fishery just has been it's on a decline or a change i don't know i don't know what it is but i did manage by july after only catching a couple fish in the sound um fish in that South Shore area. So I was lucky enough, like you say, for the first time in years to literally come home with my limit every time. And the average fish was probably three and a half pounds, maybe more. And um, I had my biggest fish over eight, bunch of sixes, all, you know, on cup. But the point is I got to eat uh, fluke sashimi all different ways. And let me tell you something, mm-hmm. that is a really good fish to sushi. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, and, and to make sashimi, I'm, I'm basically a sashimi guy, but, uh, yep. yeah, so- I don't cook fluke when I catch them anymore. I, I feel it. It's once you have some fresh sashimi, um, cooking it, just, I don't know, it just turns it to mush. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I tell you, I made a ceviche last night. Uh, from the sea bass I had out at Orient mm. this past weekend. And let me tell you, like you say, I made a big giant bowl, all gone, my limit gone <laughs> in, one, oh, yeah. in one night. So um, so uh, tell me about, do you do any kind of like uh, tagging research there or... Uh, you know, I've seen pictures of turtles going out with these satellites on their yeah, uh, yeah. on their shell. Yeah. Do you, that's kind of stuff you do. So at the, I, at right here, where I am, I'm, I'm not currently working with any researchers right now that are tagging anything. We had a researcher tagging summer flounder um, a couple summers ago. She was using acoustic tags to monitor how they move around in the bay uh, and to see if they come back year after year. Uh, at main campus, we have someone who's tagging uh, sharks. Uh, they've also tagged sturgeon. Uh, myself, uh, you mentioned the sea turtles. That was with the New York Marine Rescue Center. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is at the Long Island Aquarium. They were, uh, I'm still good friends with them. I worked there for many years and uh, they were doing some turtle releases. So they invited me to come out and take some pictures and whatnot. Uh, but then as my, my side guy, as fish guy, <clears throat> I am part of the South Fork Museum, South Fork Natural History Museum, uh, which is out in Bridgehampton. And I'm part of their shark research and education program. So 
me and three colleagues started this a few years back about, uh, I guess it was about 2013. And uh, just as four friends, I went to school together. We went to college at LIU Southampton, and uh, we're all in the field in some aspect. There's myself, uh, Greg Metzger is a high school teacher at Southampton. Um, Toby Curtis is a PhD at, with NOAA. Uh, he's a shark researcher. And uh, Frank Cuvedo is the director of the museum. So we would get out and just go shark fishing and tagging sharks. And uh, long story short, we ended up getting someone donating a satellite pop-off tag, which is about a $2,000 tag. Um, um, they donated to us because they saw how many sharks we'd been tagged, and they said, here, put this out on something cool. And we uh, tagged a four-foot young of the year uh, white shark out of Shark. Nice, on. nice. And we put that tag on it, and turned out that was the first ever uh, juvenile white shark tag with a satellite tag in the Atlantic. And uh, that got around, and then Chris Fisher from O-Search, uh, he reached out to us, and he said, hey, we want to come out there and help you guys catch more. And over two seasons, we collected 20 more with them. Uh, and since then we've collected, we've caught another 10 or 11. We're up to, I think 32 young of the year white sharks here on Long Island. Wow. Uh, we've also been tagging, uh, thresher sharks with, um, the, a type of tag known as a cat's cam so that it actually will record speed and pitch and yaw and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's been super exciting. Um, so we've been doing that. And again, it started as just four friends and now we're based out of the SOFO, which is the South Fork Natural History Museum in Bridgehampton. Wow. Wow, that's great. That's, and it's been that's... exciting, you know, and it's been a lot of fun. And, and uh, we've got uh, some really cool stuff. Uh, we just got a few new grants that I, I don't know all the exact details, but uh, we just got some really big grants to do some serious tagging next season. So if anyone's interested, they could check out uh, SOFO.org and uh, they'll get information on that as well. Oh, that would, yeah, that would uh, really be great. I'd love to be involved in uh, in those studies. Although I have to admit, I I was never a big fan of the uh, the ALS tag, the one where you used to have to stick the needle through the bottom of the tag. Are they still using that same one? Do you know? Yeah, the, you know those those tags work. Uh, they work pretty great. I mean, you know, it's uh, the only thing about them is it's only you get two points, two data points. You know, so you're not getting really much of the life of the shark. So. Our right. very first recapture was a mako that we tagged five miles out of Shinnecock, and it was recaptured 2,200 miles away off of Africa a year and seven months later. Could you imagine? Um, so, you know, we got growth on it, and we got two points, but who knows what the shark did. Uh, now, these pop-off satellite tags that we put on, they can be set for different times, and most of the ones we've been doing are a 30-day tag, and it'll record location, temperature, depth. Um, so it can record all sorts of stuff, and then it pops off and then transmits the data to us. If we find the tag, we can actually download even more data because it, it records um, uh, 20 data points every five seconds, I believe it is. So it's, it's just a crazy amount of data that these things record um, that always can't be transmitted. So, uh, But when we get them back, which last year we were good, we got five of our six tags back, and at two grand a pop, that's not a bad, uh, not a bad thing. But, no, um, really? You know, so it, yes, yeah, so, and then there's acoustic tags. I mean, so we haven't done much acoustic tags, but when O Search was up here, we did quite a few of them. And when acoustic tag is, it goes internally, so you surgically implant the the, the uh, tag, and it emits a little beep. And then there are receivers throughout the world. You know, there are biologists studying all sorts of using these tags. So anytime a shark swims by one of these receivers, uh, it pings and it records that look that fish's location or that it was there. Uh, we actually had one of our white sharks ping on some buoys inside Great South Bay. Uh, we never knew about it because it, the satellite tag, it never broke the surface or anything like that, so we didn't get a satellite ping. But it swam past a couple buoys in the bay, stayed there for a little while, and then swam back out. Um, I've heard of that. that because, I've actually yeah. heard of that in the past, years past, that uh, people have seen them come in and just go out so uh yeah and you know and that's just it if we're getting one that's pinging once you know coming in and doing it once chances are it's not a fluke it's probably he's not alone <laughs> yeah it's not alone and and you know but but that's what's exciting about these these tagging these tags the technology is get they're getting smaller the battery life is lasting longer and we're able to get to see some really cool stuff um so yeah so it's it's exciting time for when it comes to this kind of thing and i think these type of tags can really help fisheries managers a hell of a lot more because uh, we'll get a better picture of what these fish are actually 
you're doing as opposed to just relying on a survey. You know, now we can see, all right, these fish are, you know, things are different. Something's changed. They're moving offshore. They're inshore, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I think this technology is only going to help us in the, in the long run. So this year, I'm not sure if you'll agree, but I, I think you might. Um, we saw more bite-offs of shark on tuna than I think I've ever seen in all the years added up. Either that or maybe because there weren't pictures in years past. But, I mean, trip after trip, fish after fish was getting chomped uh, by a shark. You'd think they were just in there taking advantage of the situation. Um, sure. I mean, you know, sharks are a top predator, you know, and, and top predators are not dumb. You know, uh, why waste energy chasing a fish if you can grab an injured one or, or, or a uh, one that's suffers, uh, struggling on a line, you know? So there's definitely that. Um, you know, I, I, I've heard a lot of this as well. People saying, ah, oh, I keep losing these tuna to the shark or the tax man keeps coming. And, you know, and uh, as much as it sucks, <laughs> you know, when you've got that fish and you lose, it um you got to really look at the big picture too you know sharks are a big part of our ecosystem and when you start seeing sharks in an ecosystem it's a good sign of a healthy ecosystem you know? i totally 100 percent uh, agree it scares too many people um right but it's you know what we're a much healthier fishery with sharks than we are without the shark it, it's just the way it is and and let's face it too you know you you i don't do a, i don't get to do a whole lot of tuna fishing myself but from what i've seen it seems like the last couple of years the bluefin bite has been phenomenal the best. Uh, lasting a lot longer than it ever has yeah uh yellowfin are coming in a little tighter some people you know smaller boats are able to get in on some yellowfin yep. action you know and you know so that's a sign too that you know all right these fish we're starting to see more of them as water's clean clean up as there's more food for them. They're going to increase in numbers as they increase in numbers. Their predators are going to increase in number, you know, and you know, it's funny because people would love to see, Oh, get rid of all the sharks. So we have nothing eating the tuna and then we'll have more tuna, but it just doesn't work that way. You know, without those checks and balances and that, that, that balance within that ecosystem, you know, you throw things off. Um, you know, that fluke researcher I mentioned earlier, um, she does diet content on fluke. And one thing she's seen a lot in their stomachs are young of the year winter flounder. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, there weren't a whole lot of fluke around. Now, all right, there's not, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of keepers around lately, but there's definitely a lot more fluke than I remember ever catching as a kid. You know, it's uh, funny. I've said that same thing. You know, the you know, Long Island Sound see, had no fluke. We didn't, well, they might have been there, but we didn't target them. Right. You know? So, you know, again, as so, you know, is some of the winter flounder thing, you know, uh, also because now another predator is more abundant than it used to be that's now taking out the young of the year. You know, so there's all these, everything is in balance, but, you know, you need these top predators to keep everything below it in check you know they don't just eat tuna you know the shark you know getting back to the shark there kind of you know again you need these everything is there's a predator that's there to keep everything else below it in check you know and uh so is uh, there anyone looking at the uh seal population and because i think we both uh no it kind of has exploded over the last you know five to ten years and I'm, i'm wondering um, if it's a concern or if you know if it's a concern of fisheries managers that it, yeah. you know, it could cause, you know, Cape Cod like attacks. Sure. And, you know, and that's and so but that's something else, too. So like the gray seal, which is causing all these issues up in New England with the white sharks, we hunted them to extinction in, in the United States. They yeah. were gone. Yeah. Um, you know, and people might be like, well, that's great. We don't want them anyway. They're this, that, you know, but again, they play a role. You know, everything is there for a reason. And, um, you know, now that they've been protected, their numbers have come back. Um you know, as far as their population, I don't know where it was historically, um, you know, but, you know, I know locally uh, we're seeing seals, you know, larger numbers than we used to when I was a kid. I mean, when I was a kid, flounder fishing, we never, ever, ever saw seals. Um, yeah. Now they're, you know, they're yeah, you go out in the winter, you could see a hundred of them. But, you know, people blame the seals for like the winter flounder. And like I said, when I was a kid and we saw the last of the winter flounder, there were no seals here yet. Now, are seals eating winter flounder now? Sure. I'm not going to say they're not, um, but is that why they're not making a comeback? Uh, in my opinion, probably not. 
uh, you know, winter flounder, they spawn in the bays. They need eelgrass. Uh, in the early 80s, 70% of our eelgrass beds were wiped out due to the brown tide. Yeah. Um, so now if you don't have, again, getting back to like we keep circling back around, but that whole big picture, you know, we could put you know, tight regulations and a moratorium on winter flounder. But if there's no eelgrass beds for them to spawn – or for their young to at least avoid predation from fluke and other things, uh, how would we expect them to make a comeback? You know, so again, it's it's a big picture of things. That, you know, and you know, absolutely. Don't, absolutely don't want to look agree. at certain stuff. Well, I, I think the other issue, uh, it, not that it's water quality, but it's probably a combination of a lot of things because the, you know, the commercial fishery never has a problem uh, getting their limit offshore, but. We're not, we're just not getting them in the bays. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's kind of the forgotten fish. The weak fish was another one, which I happen to be the New York rep on. Um, but they seem to be coming back somewhat. You know, maybe we're we're in an up cycle and maybe someone will take it seriously this time. Um, well, that's just it, too. There are natural cycles. You know, things naturally go up and down. And and a lot of that has to do with a predator-prey predator, pr- predator prey relationship. You know, so when the prey booms, you know, because there's no predators around, well, then when there's an abundance of prey, well, the predators do well. You know, then they get, they go up, and then they eat more than, you know, they, they overgraze or overfeed or whatever, and then the prey drops off. But then the predators are going to drop off also because there's not enough food for them. So you get this natural up and down, like, cycle, like a wave. It's kind of two waves, and the, the predator wave follows the prey wave. And that's, that's seen on land too. I mean, look at, you know, look at, uh, turkeys and, and fox or, you know, um, uh, fisher and things like that, you know, as turkey populations boost, you know, other, other populations will benefit and then they'll crash, you know, so it's, Absolutely. it's definitely that natural cycle, but then you throw us into the mix and that kind of screws things up a little bit more. Yeah, no doubt. So I want to, I want to ask you your opinion. You know, there's a lot of, uh, photos on social media of anglers that are fishing shark from the beach. I know I mentioned, I know I asked if it, if you were doing that. I only asked that because the guy said, oh, he said his name was Chris. And I was like, I don't think he's <laughs> taking a kayak. And dro- if anything, he'll fly his drone out there and drop a bait. He's not going to be <laughs> taking his kayak out. But, you know, a lot of people are fishing for shark from the beach, which I know yep. is not illegal, according to where you are. Well, um, actually, actually, in New York, it is illegal. That's the that's where the, the issue becomes is uh, because this, the only species generally that you're going to catch from the surf are sand tiger, dusky, and sandbar. And all three of those are prohibited species that you're not even allowed to target. See, so like a white shark is is a uh, – you're not allowed to retain any, but you can target. The sand tiger, the brown, or the sandbar, and the dusky, they're prohibited species. So legally, you're not even allowed to target those sharks. So if you're fishing from shore for sharks on Long Island, those are the species you're targeting, which means at that point, then you're breaking the law because you're not supposed to target them. Well, we all know that uh, we can trust anglers to a certain extent, right? So an angler is going to say, well, you know, we've caught many threshers in shore. Sure. You sure, know. and that's the thing. You could say you're, you're thresher shark fishing, and or a mako shark fishing. Um, sure, I get you know that you know you say you're blue fishing, you know, and that's what a lot of people end up doing. You know, me personally, I mean, I know the rush of fishing and catching something from the surf, and I can't say I've ever caught one of those larger sharks from the surf, but it's got to be amazing. Uh, the problem though is just the it's social media. Um, people yeah. can't just catch the shark and release it; they got to drag it by its tail right. up on the beach. Right. You know, and now you think you're talking about a couple hundred pound shark that you're pulling by its tail. Now you're dislocating its vertebrae because you're dragging it through sand. You're getting dry sand in its gills, in its mouth, in its eyes. You're ripping the shark out of the mouth. You're posing with that macho, pull the shark back. So let me show you its teeth. Well, that's then you illegal. Drag it back to the surf. Well, and right, and even that, if you know, if you catch a prohibited species, you're supposed to unhook it and release it as quickly you as possible. You cannot hold it and take a photo. I tell these right, people right. That I, means you're not going as quickly as possible. So, so that's that's where I have the problem with it. It's it's to me, it's not as much of the catching of the sharks or the targeting of sharks. It's the after effect. 
because, you know, everybody, oh, it swam away. You know, just because it swam away doesn't mean anything. You know how many calls I get for dead sand tigers, dead duskies, and dead sandbar sharks that wash up locally? And I, because a lot, the DEC knows we're studying the sharks and do stuff so that they want us to get the samples. But we get calls all summer long about these sharks that are washing up dead. Uh, yeah. They're all bycat. They're all caught. They're all fishing recaught. And, um, you know, and it, that's that's I guess the part with me and my experience before working for Stony Brook, I was a senior biologist at the Long Island Aquarium for 13 years, and while I was there, I was in charge of the shark exhibit, uh, and I was responsible for collecting sand tigers and duskies and brown sharks, and I know what kind of handling they can take and what they can't take, and I'll tell you right now, the dragging of a sand tiger up on the beach is something they cannot handle. Um, it's just not good for them. You know, they don't have a large liver, so they don't. They're using buoyancy to they'll actually gulp air uh to maintain neutral buoyancy they you know they don't have a swim bladder and a lot of your sharks have a big large liver that helps maintain their buoyancy but sand tigers will actually gulp air uh when you drag them up on the beach like that or handle them like that that air often gets this 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 pushed out of their stomach then they have a hard time regaining their balance it's or their their buoyancy they have a hard time getting back to the surface um so you know again if 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 people were doing it legit you know and it's not just sharks i mean striped bass fluke you see people holding stuff that they just want the picture for social media they don't really care about the fish because if you cared about the fish you'd have somebody there with you that took a picture while you're you're unhooking and releasing it you know not holding it by the gills holding it by the tail that's the kind of stuff that uh is where the the major problem begins it's it's more of a social media thing that it is the love for fishing anymore well i you know what i couldn't agree with you more and i'm gonna say this is where our state and dec is lacking some because most of these issues can easily be resolved with education the the majority of you educate an angler and he stops you tell him use a circle hook you're going to save a lot of fish They want to save fish. That's what we do. You know, as anglers, we are stewards of the sea, right? Oh, so- sure. I, I completely agree with that 100%. Most, most anglers are want to do the right thing. And, that, and that's, I'll, I'll agree with that 100%. Yeah, it's just they need to know what the right thing is, what the wrong thing is. There's so many, you know, with all, with social media, there's just, I mean, yesterday I was reading this big long thread about people that had inside information that the blackfish season wasn't going to open. I mean, it, it's not true. You know, and right. and there were a bunch of captains what, that were worried and, you know, um, so while social media should be serving us, because I'll tell you right now, we did a survey um, through our Instagram account. We got like, I don't know how many, 1,500 replies. Um, we sent it into ASMFC and they, you know, they looked at it. They understood what the people wanted. I'm not sure what the people wanted were right, in fact, I'm sold that they're wrong. Um, you know, I, I think the bycatch of the big fish is so bad now because, you know, I'll give you an example. Yesterday, a friend of mine, well, a couple of days ago, a friend of mine was fishing Montauk, right? So they catch like literally a 60 pound bass. I, I see, I've seen pictures of it. So, but he's holding it up and, you know, he released it. He said he worked it, you know, but. He didn't get a, a keeper fish, so he's got a fish again. So now what right. do they do to catch a 40-pounder, you know? And they were into all big fish. So now you're catching and releasing all these big fish, which have a much higher mort- uh, mortality rate, you know, than the smaller fish. And uh, and you just could fish and release, catch and release all day. It's going to result in more bycatch death. But... Look. Oh, yeah. No, and that's just it. That's like, you know, just because it swims away does not mean it's going to survive. And uh, again, my time working at the aquarium, you know, when you're trying to catch organisms to keep alive in a public aquarium setting like that, you know, it, you got to, you, you know, like I said, I've, I've seen people handling fish and moving fish. I mean, we'd work with local, you know, commercial fishermen and sometimes I'd see them like they'd just reach into their live roll, grab a bass by the gills and hand it to me. And I'm like, ugh, yeah. often that fish would not survive. Um, 
you know, yeah, those sad. fish, they're not, they're not designed to support their body weight when they're out of water. So when you pick up a big fish like that, all their internal organs just push on each other. You know, you're, you're fine. You're like, Oh, I'll support the belly. Well now you're just pushing the belly up and everything is squashing down on it. You know, yeah. realistically they, you know, for the, the hunt, the best chance for survival, they shouldn't even come out of the water. Uh, just, you know, Get them up beside the boat, get your picture looking down at them, you know, holding your thumb up, whatever, and unhooking them and let them swim off, and they'll do so much better that way. Um, to- but, totally you know, agree. Totally it's agree. Just, it's all about just, you know, getting them out there and light tackle, you know, that, that you know, just fighting them for an hour just because it's fun. That doesn't necessarily get them back in, in good shape either. So, But I always try to tell people just because it swims away does not mean it's going to survive. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, I mean, if, if you gut hook a fish, well, look, we could go on and on and on. Yeah, and yeah. I do <laughs> intend on doing a special on, uh, you know, how to treat fish if uh, if you really do want to save them. So, Chris, I mean, this has been like I could just keep talking and talking and talking, but. Uh, stats show people don't like listening to podcasts longer than an hour. So, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so let's definitely do this again. And maybe you want to mention how people can reach out to you, what they can do for you. Um, if yeah, you- definitely. Um, you know, social. I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram. I'm even on Twitter. As much as I hate Twitter because it's just more fighting there than anywhere. But I'm there if you're on it. Uh, but yeah. it's at Fish Guy Photos. Um, you can visit my website as well, www.fishguyphotos.com. Um, check out my YouTube channel at Fish Guy Photos, Vimeo at Fish Guy Photos. Um, you know, and, and give me a follow. I, I try to post stuff about local wildlife, um, not just fish. I am the fish guy and a marine biologist and everything, but, um, you know, I, uh, I'm a falconer. So I hunt with a red tail hawk. So in the wintertime, uh, there's a lot of pictures of that. And I also just like to focus on other local wildlife that's here, not just fish. Because you know what? A day in the water is great. But, you know, sometimes we're missing all the other cool stuff that's around that could make it even that much better. Like, so like the bald eagles kind of and the uh, a lot of people don't know about all the bald eagles we have around here. Right yeah, now. eagles and falcons. and I yeah. mean, so yeah. much cool stuff here. So I, I really, and I try to just promote the, the positive because you know what? There's enough negative stuff out there to get us all depressed. So I really just try to focus on all the cool stuff that's here and, and the good stuff that's happening. And uh, totally yeah, agree. I, feel free to give me a follow or you catch something cool and you want to ID it, send me a picture, DM me a picture. I'd be happy to uh, let you know what you caught. Okay. Well, look, we appreciate you allowing us to uh, repost some of your stuff on our Instagram account. And again, folks, make sure you follow Fish Guy Photos. Uh, Chris is really knows his stuff, and uh, we, we're definitely going to have you back on, uh, Chris, because, you know, we're, we're looking to do a few things ourselves, and, uh, you know, maybe it would mean helping helping you guys. So, um we will definitely be in touch and I so appreciate, uh, you know, everything that you're doing, just showing people, you know, that they live on a, on an Island that is just so full of nature. And, you know, I can mention one thing you said, you took photos, not just of fish and because of a photo that you took of a long daddy long leg, <laughs> I am not allowed to kill him anymore. Now I got to catch him and let him go. I'm like, I can't even. But it, my wife was like, look at it. I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at it. All right. But look at it. I'm like, all right, you're right. I won't kill him. But, uh, but in the meantime, yeah. you know, I'll cut a green crab in half, though. I won't think twice about that. <laughs> So oh, yeah, and that's just it. There's so much cool stuff even in your own backyard. So you just yeah. have to you just have to slow down and and pay attention. You'll be amazed what you'll see. Uh, we're gonna have you on again, and uh, you're gonna have to teach me how to do the video thing. Uh, pretty soon we'll be uh, we'll be going video, so I'll be talking to you. No, that'd be great. Now, thanks so much, George. This was this was awesome. I really enjoyed our conversation, and uh, yeah, I look forward to doing it again. All right. It was great having you. And thanks again. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that was one great interview. And I'd like to thank Chris once again for joining us here at the show. And I look forward to having him on again. 
and hopefully he'll be joining us uh, once we get our YouTube channel up and running. I'd also like to mention I have another podcast coming out right after this one. We're going to update the situation right now with fishing. I mean, for boat fishermen, it's a little tough right now. Uh, those fans have been blowing. The wind is uh, the wind just doesn't seem to want to die down. It's kind of keeping me at the dock. Uh, I was lucky enough to get out and get some nice sea bass last week, which I really enjoy. And uh, by the way, I did make a really good ceviche with with the uh, with the sea bass. It, that really makes the, the best ceviche. And I'll tell you what, um, there's nothing like a Long Island fresh sea bass. I'm sorry, tops at all. So we will. I will be back, like I say, with a, with another episode pretty soon. Uh, this is a. This has been a special episode, and to me, real special. Uh, you know, I respect Chris for everything he's done and for what he does, and uh, for bringing us all those wonderful photos, videos, and information on the marine life. So, listen, folks. Be sure to keep, be safe this time of year. Waters get cold. Waters get rough. Don't take any unnecessary chances. Your life isn't worth it. We've had too many accidents so far this year. I also know we have a lot of anglers headed out that have never owned a boat. Uh, so please be careful. This is a, a different time. Waters are nothing like they were in the spring and summer. So be careful, especially getting out of your inlets. Make sure you know what you're doing. And be sure to subscribe to the New York Fishing Podcast, which you could get on any platform, all podcast pla uh, platforms. Uh, for an iPhone, just simply say, hey, Siri, play the fishing, the New York Fishing Podcast, and it'll work. So, again, thank you all. Watch for my next one. And I once again like to thank. Chris Paparo for uh, such a great interview. Thank you for listening to the New York Angler Podcast. You can find more on fishing New York waters at nyangler.com, your secret spot online.